I'd like to thank Holder for his kind words and everybody for the opportunity to come and speak. Except Steve, basically. I assume he's the one that made the schedule. <laughs> topic today is audience relevance. Somebody may be saying, well, that's just more or less common sense. Well, that I would agree with. But unfortunately, it's common sense that's too often ignored. And you can look at a passage of Scripture and say, and, and automatically, most times, tell exactly who the intended audience was. And then at other times, you may think to yourself, well, I'm not quite sure. But you'll study to find out who it was. But then there's times that, and I'm guilty of this just like everybody else, that you will read yourself right into a passage that was not intended directly for you. Common sense, right? We all make this mistake. It just happens. How do we correct it, right? We correct our thinking on these things. I remember seeing a, a cartoon, and it's, it's probably been a few months back. <laughs> this guy was standing in front of another person, and he was talking to that person right in front of him, but he was pointing to the person or the people behind him. He was not talking about the people, but he was talking to the person directly in front of him. So who is the intended audience? I know it's a trick question, right? Like I said, Steve made the schedule. <laughs> I've defined it just simply as this, the relevance of a statement or event to the initial audience. To whom does it apply? What did it mean to them? And case in point, Isaiah 39. I didn't do the PowerPoint thing, so I kind of like to see people and hear people flipping pages, especially when you're in danger of falling asleep. <laughs> Trust me, I've got the clear eyes guy voice, so it's going to be easy for you to fall asleep. Isaiah 39, 1 through 8. At that time, Merodach Baladon, the son of Baladon, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with him and showed him the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all of his armor. All that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Now, you, many of you are familiar with this situation. You understand what's going on here. That uh, Hezekiah is a sort of boasting. But at the same time, Isaiah is going to let him know that this futile boasting that you're doing is going to cost your ancestors all that you just showed Babylon. Because in verse 3 it says, Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say and where did they come from? Or from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came to me from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? I like the interrogation part, right? So Hezekiah answered and said, Well, they've seen all that, that is in my house. There's nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. If you are a king in Israel back in those days, and a prophet comes to you asking you questions, you know something's up to begin with. But then all of a sudden he says, Thus saith the Lord. Then you just kind of want to shrink down in your seat, right? I know if I was Hezekiah, I would have. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated unto this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. 
They shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, Notice this. The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. Hezekiah, you were just told that your, your kids and grandchildren are going to be carried away captive by a foreign nation whom you just got through showing all the treasures of your kingdom. What do you mean it's good? Well, it's a matter of something that they had. See why he says that. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. Now that may sound selfish of Hezekiah, but in truth what's going on here is Hezekiah is recognizing that I, what Isaiah is prophesying is not directly for Hezekiah but for a time later for his descendants. Our first text this afternoon is going to be Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. You know what's interesting is sometimes when I'm in other places speaking, aside from my voice, <laughs> you'll hear people groaning. Moaning and groaning, just kind of grunting. Oh, uh, really? Like, do we really have to go to the Old Testament? Do we have to study something that we're not real sure about? I mean, do, do we have to read it and understand it immediately? And you'll just hear that sigh or that groan and that grunt. It's like, Folks, from Genesis all the way to maps, well, the maps aren't inspired, but from Genesis all the way to, the way to Revelation, chapter 22, it's one book. I, I'm speaking to the choir, I know you, you folks agree with me, but it, it is, there are legion out there who don't. Deuteronomy 32, I'm not going to go through the entire chapter. Because I talk slow, and uh, you'll definitely be asleep, but I don't have that much time. This is a massive chapter. I think it's got some 53 verses. 52. But nevertheless, it is a long way from beginning to end. What I do want to <clears throat> focus in on is, if I can get this to be still. The latter part of the chapter, verse 34, all the way down to verse 43. But before we go there, somebody says, you said Deuteronomy 32. Yes, I did. How many of you would just jump right into this text without really looking at the surrounding context? Understanding what Deuteronomy 31 is talking about, and then later on, the blessings of Deuteronomy 33. Not, would you not read it all together? I mean, you kind of want to go back to chapter 31 and say, what's this about? You know, what is the context, the setting of this song? And that's what it's called. We would go back to verse 14 of chapter 31. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach. When you must not call Joshua, present yourselves in the tabernacle of me that I may inaugurate him. So here's the exaltation of Joshua. Because Moses is fixing to be told that he's going to, be, he's going to die. He's going to rest with his fathers, his ancestors. Someone has to replace him. So Moses and Joshua came and, or went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of me. Now, the Lord appeared at the tabernacle, tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud. And the pillar of the cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers. And this people will rise up and play the harlot, that's spiritual adultery, with the gods of the foreigners of the land. What land? The one that they go to possess. Where are they going to be among them? They will forsake me and break my covenant, my heaven and earth, which I'm, I have made with them. Then my anger shall be aroused against them. 
in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, being evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not, not among us? Now think about that. Think about that. Have not, has not this happened to us because God is not with us? Yes. He's turned his back on you. Just like you turned your back on him. So in verse 18, pick it up. And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they have done. And that they turn to other gods. What's the first commandment? You're going to have none other. Yeah. Now therefore write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths. That this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. You're starting to see something develop here, aren't you? When I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey. Chapter 34 of this, the same book, is going to tell us Moses. Moses ain't going into the promised land. But here's Moses going to recite the song in the hearing of the children of Israel. Following me so far? Now, this land of milk and honey is the one he swore to their fathers, their ancestors. Abraham. And they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat. Then they will turn to other gods and serve them. We don't know what that's like, do we? When everything's so comfortable and going so smooth, and we just kind of a little lazy, a little lax. They will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song, which Moses is fixing to recite in their hearing, will testify against them as a witness. For it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. I know the inclination of their behavior today. Even before I have brought them to the land of which I swore to give them. Now, I want you to notice the grace of God in that passage right there. God says, I know what they're going to do. I know exactly how they're going to treat me. I know exactly how they're going to treat one another. I know exactly how they're going to exalt these other so-called little G demigods above me. But I'm still giving them an inheritance. Therefore Moses wrote this song, verse 22, the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. Then he inaugurated Joshua, the son of Dun, son of Nun, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Alright. Jump down to verse 29 for time's sake. For I know, this is Moses, I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt. And turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. Literally, when you follow the Apostle Peter's pattern of interpreting this phrase from the Hebrew to the Greek, and in the Septuagint, it is that way. It says last days. Just like Peter had reiterated what Joel had prophesied. Peter called it the last days in Acts chapter 2. Speaking of uh, Joel's prophecy from Joel chapter 2. Same phrase. In the last days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him that anger to the work of your hands. Then Moses spake in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were done. Until they were finished. And unlike Moses, I'm not going to do this for the sake of audience relevance. We are not going into a promised land that our ancestors were promised. Brethren, if you understand the fulfillment, you're in that land right now. That's what Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4 is teaching us. There remained a Sabbath, a keeping of the Sabbath for the children of God. That's you and I living in the promised land today. That promised inheritance that God, Yahweh the Father, was going to give to His children. 
foreshadowed by this right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to... There's something I want to bring up. I told myself I wasn't going to do this, but I can't help it. It's, it, it's a great example of, of how this passage is thought of and treated and considered in the minds of the Church of Christ today and, and many other groups and their preachers. This song of Moses in the uh, 2020 Neubauer Reeves debate. I'm sure most of you saw that. One of the participants is sitting right over here. In case y'all didn't know, it's over Neubauer. On his phone. <laughs> <laughs> I just forgot to send in my radio program for Sunday. So <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the director of the radio program just told me where's my program. I <laughs> In that debate, Brother Bruce Reeves had they had this uh, he had this chart on the screen, and on this chart, right about in here. Well, the chart, I'm sorry, the chart was about Deuteronomy 32 and all the prophecies found in this song of Moses, and. Right about there on the chart, oh, I should have brought it. I know. But if you want to just look it up on YouTube or on Facebook, it's the Reeves Third Affirmative during that debate. Mr. Reeves put a chart concerning Deuteronomy 32 and how all of these prophecies, and what I found so interesting is it's going by. Similarity of language. Similarity of speech. Which they condemn us for. But aside from that, he goes into that prophecy of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32. And he traces most of what he could find throughout the prophets. And says, well, this is when that prophecy was fulfilled. Now, if you fill something up, to the rim, are you putting another drop in there? That's, you know, I may be simple headed. Well, I know I'm simple headed. I might be just a little simple minded about this, but that's how I understand fulfillment. Once you fill it up to the rim, you can't add another drop. You're not going to be able to add more fulfillment to it, right? I'm so full from lunch. <laughs> I really don't want to eat another bite. Well, I'm fulfilled. Right? Alright. So, if in fact Mr. Reeves was right, and he's not, and his chart, defending his doctrine, was totally correct, and it was not, that was fulfilled back in the days of Israel as a covenant nation living in the promised land and so on and so forth, has nothing at all to do with the last days. But yet here we have Moses in chapter 31 and verse 29 saying last days aka latter days Mr. Reeves in his little box on that, that chart had labeled the prophecy of Deuteronomy 32 itself as a general description of the outcome of God's people if they rebelled <clears throat> sounds good don't you? logical Makes sense. Yeah, I would agree with you. It was a general description of what would happen to them if they rebelled against God. But it was not something that was so ambiguous that it did not have a certain generation in mind. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about here in a second. Was Moses just being ambiguous? Was God being just ambiguous when he says, you speak this song in the hearing of all the people? Just general or specific thing. There's, there's no intended meaning to this. It's just, they're going to do what they're going to do. You just be sure and let them know that when they're getting their butts spanked, and that's me doing it. Is that what God is saying through Moses here? Obviously not. Obviously not. I'll tell you why. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5. Let's read it together. 
Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5. They have corrupted themselves. They're not His children because of their blemish. A perverse and crooked generation. Anybody heard those words in the New Testament? You heard it on the day of Pentecost, didn't you? Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. Old King James, an untoward generation. New King James are perverse. Right? So if Mr. Reeves is right, and all of this had its fulfillment back in the days of the prophets before Malachi prophesied his last, what in the world is Peter talking about? Or how about the Lord Himself? Matthew 16, 4, Matthew 17, 17. When He talks about them being a, a, a wicked and adulterous generation. Does He know what He's talking about? I would say so. How about, uh, I already mentioned Acts 2, 40. How about Paul in Philippians 2 and verse 15? They are crooked and perverse Nation. Nation. If you look throughout all of the prophets, you're going to find every nation under heaven mentioned being judged by God at one point or another. You're going to find it. You're going to find this nation of Israel being judged multiple times, right? My contention is simple. Paul says nation. Because he is making sure they know that they are that nation. It is their turn for judgment. It's not Rome's turn for judgment. It's not uh, Greece's turn for judgment. It's not time for North America's turn for judgment. It's time for their judgment. They're a crooked and perverse nation. Look at verse 11. As an eagle stirs up its nest, over, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. And then the next verse. So the Lord alone led him. There was no foreign God with him. How about that? For care, protection, provision. Yahweh giving that to them. But does that sound like anything you've ever heard in the New Testament? Maybe something that the Lord said to him. Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often I would have... And you know the rest. You know the rest. You think the Lord was right there applying Deuteronomy 32, verse 11? You betcha. How about verse 21? They provoke me to jealousy by what is not a God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But, God says, I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. Have you read that before in your New Testament? Is there a purpose for which the Apostle Paul made that statement and applied it to his generation? Or is this just one of those general, ambiguous, Johnny-come-lately prophecies that you could use at any time for any reason? Does Paul have an audience in mind? Yes, he does. The same audience that God did when He gave it to Moses for Deuteronomy 32. Tell you why. Back up to verse 20. He said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be for their perverse generation. Children in whom is no faith. Matthew 17, 17. What their end will be. Somebody says, well, wait a minute. You know, I read not too long ago in Ezekiel 7 that the that an end. The end has come upon my people, God says through that, that prophet. So which end is it? He's answering this if we'll just let it. If we'll not just 
just not jump to conclusions. He's giving us which end he's talking about. Not just some ambiguous run of the mill end. Verse 29 is the latter end. Look at verse 35. Roy, you brought this up earlier. Well, actually, verse 34 is just not laid up in store with me. <clears throat> Sealed up among my treasures. And that's a great point on the that which is stored up. Great point on that. I'd like to add to it, or excuse me, point out how the Apostle Paul added to that. Peter said it, but Peter was not alone to find it today. Somebody says, oh, there's a lull. It's time to go to sleep. <laughs> you get that short guy to quit rambling and go to sleep. Be good. Listen to this. One of my favorite passages in Scripture. Because when you're teaching the lost, what the gospel is. This, this really brings out the purpose of the gospel. Romans 2 and verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of His goodness? Forbearance, long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness his long suffering, his patience, his endurance with us. So imperfect. The holy, his goodness, leads us to repentance. We know this firsthand. We saw the love, grace, and mercy of God. And he came in faithful obedience to his gospel. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, revelation, the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. There's that treasure. They're opening God's storehouse. This generation. This generation. What is it, three times in Matthew 24? This generation, this generation, this generation. Not one which is afar off. There's some ambiguous generation. Some general audience. No, but this generation. As the Lord said it to them. It's sealed up among His treasures. He says, vengeance is mine. Their foot will slip. Here's another time statement. In time. I realize most of our translations have the word do there in due time. And make of that what you will. But it is a specific time. The Greek word is chronos. In a specific time. A set time. For the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things to come hasten upon them. Oh boy, here we go. Howard Denham loves that. He loves that passage right there, and I'll tell you why. He's used it against numerous brethren. He used it against Holger, tried to use it against Holger in debate twice. He tried to use it uh, I think one day when he was arguing with Roy as well on a Facebook post. Don't quote me on this. He used it against me. You guys are always saying that at hand always means within reach. It always means at hand. What do you do with Deuteronomy or uh, yeah, Deuteronomy 32, verse 35 and verse 36. Specifically, verse 35. What do you do with it? We pay close attention to it. That's what we do with it. That's right. <laughs> we're, not, we're not just being, <laughs> trying to be uh, humorous with it. In due time, the day of their calamity is at hand. When? In due time. If this was at hand, Moses would be suffering from these same things. It was that close. 
the things to come hasten upon them. Moses would have this to deal with. Moses would be partaker in this. But Moses has already been told, you're going to rest with your ancestors. For the Lord will judge His people and have compassion on His servants. When He has seen that their power is gone, there is none remaining bond or free. What time am I supposed to stop? Uh, you, you, you've got 10 to 15 minutes. I ain't even made it out. I've been around for 32 years. Wow. See what I mean? It's the rambling part. But nevertheless, the Lord will judge His people. Now wait a minute. I thought He's a God of love, right? He's a, a God of mercy and kindness. And yes, all that's true, God. But He's not scared to judge His people when they forsake Him, they turn their back on Him and start serving and worshiping other gods. They've got to come. Now, which generation is it? Still too general, maybe, huh? Okay. We've already noticed chapter 31, verses 16 through 22. I haven't proven anything yet. I haven't proven that this is the first century generation, have I? No, I have not. But what you're fixing to see is going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is not these people who are fixing to go in and possess the promised land. As some would like to say, you know, what well, says it's at hand, that means it's fixed to happen to them, right? What do you guys do with that? You look in verse 29, chapter 31, as we already have seen, it's the latter days. You look in verse 20 of chapter 32, it says they're in, right? They're in, right? Not Y'all's end, as we say in Texas. He would be saying that to them. He would look at, be looking at them reciting this song and saying, your end. But he doesn't do that, does he? He says, their end. Like a generation later on to come. Their latter end, verse 29. And obviously, verse 35, in that due time in that appointed set time. Interestingly enough, in Revelation chapter 9, and I'll, I won't be here long, this uh, massive army that had been prepared was prepared for a certain day. Let me find the passage because I always look at this. I need to outline this what I need to do. I need to underline it or something. <clears throat> This was a number, a numbered army that was prepared for the hour, the day, month, and year. Revelation 9 and verse 15. Now, if that's not the description or a biblical definition of a set appointed time, I don't know what is. That's narrowing it down. This is what Moses is saying through this passage. In that time. When their foot shall slip. Their day of their calamity is at hand. Now, something else I want you to notice. Somebody still might be saying, when is this generation? Look at verse 43. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. For He will avenge the blood of His servants and render vengeance to His adversaries. He will provide atonement for His land and for His people. I know there's a multitude of English translations out there that differ on this verse. But the cleansing, the idea of atonement, the idea of purging is in this verse in every one of those translations. It will be in the time when the Lord provides atonement for His people. The blood of bulls and goats didn't do that. However, the blood of Christ does. You say I've got to go 2.30? Well, 3.30. No, 3.30, right? You've got to go 2.30. Five minutes. Paul is a little man and he spoke till midnight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. That would probably get horse by the way. Yeah, no, no. We got no one to raise up any 
everybody would know. <laughs> it's a good point. It's a great point. And I'm not worthy at all to be an incentive. Nevertheless, everybody is home and sleep. <laughs> Daniel chapter 12. Somebody says, oh boy, here go those predators. They're going to Daniel chapter 12. We're in trouble now. <laughs> I'm not going to spend the rest of my time in this chapter, but I do want to point something out. Daniel 12, verse 4. Shut up the words, or seal the book, till the time of the end. Verse 9. The words are closed up, sealed until the time of the end. Verse 13. Till the end, end of days. You notice how there's a definite the definitive article in front of him in every one of those passages. You think the angel was trying to get something across to Daniel so that he could get across to others? Obviously. It's a certain definitive end. Not just some ambiguous general end. As some like to say. See, as somebody so wisely pointed out earlier, earlier about the silence of heaven, is that not how most treat the word of God when they come to a passage they can't just they just can't understand it? Well, it just means for thirty minutes there's not going to be women in heaven. No silence. It's so true. It's such a good point in how I'm guilty of it before. But how so many still to these days if they don't understand it. You know, if you can joke about it, it lessens the blow and the guilt of the lack of understanding and the lack of study to understand. Daniel would rest, Daniel would sleep until the end of the days. Daniel would arise until his inheritance. That's just a summation of that chapter. But it's also a summation of the time of the end. When the power the holy people was going to be completely shattered. What was it that was stated in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35? When he sees that their power is gone. When would that be? Daniel says, or actually the angel says to Daniel, it's going to be at the end. The end of days. Ephesians chapter 30. And I'll hurry through this. It's going to take long enough. We know this New Testament pretty good, but that Old Testament, you know, we still got to do a little study and get a little bit better understanding as to what's going on. You know, I wasn't raised Hebrew, even though I'm probably about the height of what the average Hebrew was. I wasn't raised Hebrew. My mama used to say, and she was fond of saying, we were born of the Jewish tribe of Naphtali. Can't prove it, but nevertheless. My mom, she had her own ideas. <laughs> but nevertheless, Ephesians chapter 3. Listen to what Paul says. Just, just casually listen. Considering Deuteronomy 32 in your minds. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation, that's like an administration, a dispensing of the grace of God which was given to me for you. How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly, briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Now we get this. Paul, we have to read it before we can understand your knowledge of the mystery. Mystery revealed is no longer something that's concealed. It's it's no longer a mystery because it's been made known. It's not some secret except for those who don't have eyes to see nor ears to hear, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. Now turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1.
And listen to verse 3 and follow. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again. Anybody know what begotten us again means? He's caused you to be born again. Unto a living hope, right? Born from above, right? Through what? He tells us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. <laughs> to and what? What were we looking at that they were fixing to be partakers in in Deuteronomy 32? I know we didn't read all the way through. But there was an inheritance that they were fixing to receive, right? Incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. Reserved where? Heaven. For you, right? Oh boy, it's still reserved in heaven for us, ain't it? Or is it? Is it? Revelation 21. Nobody listen up to uh, Brother Roy, did they? <laughs> You've seen it. You've read it with your own two eyes while it was up there on the screen. That bride adorned, or <clears throat> that church adorned as a bride for her husband came down. That's an inheritance. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the what? Deuteronomy 31 29. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. What is a major theme that runs all the way from Genesis chapter 3 throughout the rest of Scripture? Adam sin, what needs to be done about it? That's, yeah. But what, what about Cain? What did he do to his brother? That was chapter 4, Genesis 4. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's the problem. Yeah, no, not bad. Good point. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, what's a rocket scientist? Always a rocket scientist. <laughs> uh, so Cain does what? He kills his brother, right? He's a murderer. He's a murderer. He martyrs his brother, right? Abel's sacrifice is, is accepted. Cain's is not. Cain does what? You Mr. Goody Two Shoes, and he kills him, right? You Dudley Do Right. He kills him. So you have the same thing taking place amongst God's people, not just the the Gentiles and all non-Israelite tribes. Or, uh, yeah, peoples from Genesis 10 persecuted the Israelite. But you do have uh, Israelites persecuting, putting to death Israelites. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold, perishes, though it be tri tried, tested by fire. What's that? Being grieved by various trials, may be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the Apocalypsis, revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable. I, oh, that grace of God, it leaves us speechless, doesn't it? And full of glory, receiving the end, that is the goal and the aim, the telos, of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, was indicating when he testified before him the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. The sufferings of Christ, what followed after that? The inheritance, right? The glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not unto themselves, but to us, Peter, uh, Peter says were they ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent out from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So here's Peter saying, they prophesied it. 
but their immediate audience was not the recipient. You are what Peter says. It's the exact same thing that Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3. If you noticed, just a casual reading through Ephesians 3, you can make the connection. And I say this why. Brethren, I've got an inheritance. I'm not waiting on some patch of real estate somewhere. I've got an inheritance. Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven. Is it not? I know it goes on to say, but once we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to change our corruptible body and make it like unto His incorruptible body. I realize that. But if we look back hindsight, we can see what they were looking forward to. And leave it there. Rather than trying to hijack their what is that word? Eschaton? That fancy word that everybody uses? Let's not take away from their end times. It's audience relevance. What did it mean to them first? before it means anything to us. Thank you for your time, and I'm glad that I still see all eyes on you. I must have done something right. Thank you. So thank you, Bobby. Come